Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? How's everyone doing today? Good morning. My name is Lorena Garcia. I'm the Student Org President. I would like to welcome all students, faculty, staff, and special guests to all school day. I want to do a special shout out to all the San Diego students. Where are the San Diego students at? Where are my Orange County students at? The Skirball students? Do we have any VAC students here? Oh, we have VAC. And then I know we're streaming live with VAC. Where are all the UPC students? Again, welcome. I would like to explain the guerrilla theater event that we had outside. Did you, anyone notice that? That's a visual representation of what racial profiling is. We wanted to show that racial profiling still exists in today's society. I would like to thank all the students, faculty, and staff who, were, uh, who participated in it and being a good sport. So thank you everyone and welcome. And I would like to welcome our Vice President Spencer Dunn. All right. Good morning. Um, I'd like to welcome our next presenter to the stage. Um, he may look familiar for you, to you that were here last year at All Schools Days. Um, he's a multi-award winning vocalist. Um, he, sp he sings in German, English, Italian, French, um, and he's a trained at, top, at the top five universities in America. So it's my pleasure to welcome K.B. Solomon. Good. Are you enthused? Yes. Well, you should be, because we're here to change the world, right? What are we changing it for? Equality, racial equality, social equality. We're here to make a noise. You going to help me make a noise? Why don't you help me sing this song? I always wonder what I would do if I had the power to change the world. Well, I can't do it by myself, but I've heard that collectively we can all make a change. Too often, a few are left to shoulder the burden that it takes all of us to make this change, right? So I want you to give me a little rhythm here. You know the Hammer song? This was written by Pete Seeger. If I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning. I'd hammer in the evening. All over this land, I'd hammer out danger, I'd hammer out a warning, I'd hammer out the love between my brothers and my sisters all over this land. You got the word? Now sing it again. If I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning, I'd hammer in the all over this land I'd hammer out danger I'd hammer out a warning I'd hammer out the love between My brothers and my sisters All over this land Are right, you singing with me? Ready? If I had a hammer I'd hammer in the morning I'd hammer in the evening All over this land I'd hammer out danger I'd hammer out a warning I'd hammer out the love between My brothers and my sisters All over this land Let me hear you, come on I'd hammer in the evening all over this land. I'd hammer out. I'd hammer out. A, I'd hammer out the love between my brothers and my sisters all over this land. What about a song? If I had a song, I'll sing it in the morning. 
evening, I'll sing it in the evening, all over this land. I'd sing out danger, I'd sing out a warning, I'd sing out the love between my brothers and my sisters all over this land. Come on, you can sing louder than that, can't you? One more time. If I had a song, I'd sing it in the morning. I'd sing out danger. I'd sing out the love between my brothers and my sisters all over this land. Keep clapping. My mother told me that there's got to be a higher power in this world. Some of us don't quite know what it is, but in the words of that old Negro spiritual, yes. He got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He got USC in his hands. He's got USC in his hands. He's got USC in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his hand. He's got you and me, brothers, in his hand. He's got everybody here, in his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. You. I can't believe that I sing loud with all of you folks. Okay, we'll have a competition. Can you can sing louder than me? Let's see you go. One more time. My turn. My turn, my turn. Keep laughing for me. All right. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands. Thank you to Mr. Solomon. Can we hear a round of applause for him again? Now I would like to welcome our next speaker. Professor Cherry Short is the Assistant Dean for Global and Community Initiatives here at School of Social Work. She has extensive knowledge in leadership, governmental, organizational, and the community. She is also accomplished in the virtual all aspects of social work and social policy, including criminal justice systems, direct practice, and policy development. As the Assistant Dean and Global for global and community initiatives, she continues to support USC's strategic plan for globalization and works to expand the school's global presence through international program development and partnerships. In addition, Dr. Short is heavily involved in community activities and acts as a liaison between the university, the school, and the neighboring communities. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Sherry Short. Thanks, Lorena. Thanks, Spencer, too. Um, and of course, thank KB. Good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to see so many of us here today to discuss and learn about an important topic. And I'd like to welcome again all the virtual academic students who are joining us via webcam. Can we give them a round of applause? As Lorena has stated, I'm the chair of the All School Day Committee, and I'm looking forward to a great morning. I'm sure we all are. I would like to thank the committee for their help in planning today's program, 
but I'd like to also thank former chairs and previous committee members of our All School Day because without their hard work, this event would never have continued. All School Day, as we know, is an educational forum born out of the 1992 civil unrest and has become one of our school's annual event, recognizing diversity through an exchange of ideas. This year's All School Day will be looking at the issue of immigration and social justice. As we know, this country is built by immigrants, and even since 1965, the foreign-born population in the United States have been arriving from countries such as Asia, Central America, the Caribbean, Africa, Eastern Europe, and the Middle East. We consciously, of all of us, know about the push and the pull factors that happens in, in countries. There's the push factors pushing people here, and there's the pull factors from America encouraging people also to come. Within the countries of origins, people want to go back many times to their own country, and so connections are also built. At various times throughout history, immigration policies in the United States have expressed various different impulses. Policies have been liberalized only to turn again towards exclusion. The profession of social work is concerned with immigration policies because they affect the lives of our clients and the well-being of people within and beyond our borders. Today, we have two great keynote speakers, the Honorable Gilbert Cedillo, representing the 45th District in the California State Assembly, and Professor Manuel Pasteur, co-director of USC Center of the Study of Immigrant Integration. We also have our panelist, who I'll introduce to you later. Right now, it is indeed my pleasure to introduce you today to Dean Flynn. Of course, Dean Flynn needs no introduction, but I'm going to introduce her anyway. Dean Flynn has led the School of Social Work for nearly 15 years. Over that time, we have grown from a small, well-regarded private school to the largest graduate program in the United States, with students enrolling from 38 states. She has also founded Endowment for Hamovich Research Center and has brought some of the most sought-after scholars in the world to join our faculty here at the School of Social Work. Perhaps one of her most important accomplishments has been to bring increased diversity among faculty and students, to recognize and serve previously unrecognized groups such as veterans and military families, and to highlight social justice in the culture of our schools through some unique events like our All School Day, Noche La Familia. She has also advanced the school relationship internationally, particularly in China and South Korea, and is now working with faculty to establish a new connection in Mexico and South America. Given her special appreciation of our topic today, we are so pleased to welcome Dean Flynn. Thank you, Cherry. So, Lorena, next time you're going to have Guerrilla Theater tell me about it. Uh, I walked up, I, for those of you who are joining us by webcam, when I arrived shortly before the event, uh, there were a large number of our students who were screaming for freedom, who were uh, penned up uh, with a uh, crime scene yellow tape and uh, who were being fanned into um, even more levels of excitement by our faculty. Um, 
And I thought it was all real, so I was ready to send uh, our keynote speaker home, and um, if that's what it took to admit our students. So my adrenaline is still someplace around here. It was a really interesting all-school day beginning, the best that I can recall, once I recover from the experience. So it's, it's wonderful to see all of you here and to recommit us as one body to the concept of social justice. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Gilbert Cedillo. He was elected uh, 13 years ago to the California State Assembly, and since that time, among all of the people in the assembly, he is one of the best known as a champion for the working poor and for everyone who is unjustly remaining in the shadows of mainstream society. He really believes that the immigrant agenda is the American agenda. And at the same time, which is very interesting aspect of his approach, he's always argued that progressive politics advance the interests of the business community and of California's economic development and is in fact in the long-term economic interests of everyone. So he's achieved a very unique balance in the way he's developed his agenda. It's without question that he's advanced the public good. He, among other uh, among others, was uh, responsible for a bill that brought over $50 million into infrastructure development for the community clinics across this state that serve the uninsured, and low-income, and mostly um, un undocumented patients. He's one of the most productive legislators. He's authored close to 100 bills, which is really a significant accomplishment. And these bills have been signed into law by four different California governors. Again, an, a really exceptional accomplishment. He's uh, done such things as set up fair share zoning for homeless shelters in cities. He's defended workers' rights to organize. Uh, most importantly, recently, he was responsible for the groundbreaking California Dream Act for children of undocumented families. So he's here today really because in his political and public life, he's addressed the claims of all of California's marginalized communities, including Chinese, Koreans, Mexicans, and others. He's doing it one community at a time. So he's become a legendary advocate. He's a voice for the least, the last, and the lost, which is a hallmark of our profession. So I ask you to welcome Gilbert Cedillo. Dean Flynn, thank you so much, and safe travels on your, uh, your journey. Uh, let me say, um, I'm very flattered to be here with you this morning. Um, very, very flattered. First, first, let me begin with a few hellos and a few, few thank yous. I'm very flattered to be here with all, all of you this morning. And it's quite a journey for me, personally, because I grew up just a few miles from here. I grew up in Boyle Heights and uh, representing a group in Boyle Heights and, uh, <laughs> and had a great experience. I, 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 uh, at 15, I, I participated. I'm turning my phone off. My mother will call me in a minute. Uh, 
How do mothers know what to call you when you're in front of a podium, in front of thousands of people? I don't know. So, um, so I grew up in Borough Heights. One day I got on a bus, took me to a school on the west side of Los Angeles. I won't say where, but it's blue and gold. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I lived there for three summers in high school. I had a friend named Tony who came with me uh, and then got a state scholarship and went to, went to the school and, and graduated from there. And, and it changed my life. And, and so I want to applaud all of you who are here because being here today and being on this campus at this critical time period of our lives and the lives of our nation, it really is a really extraordinary moment because what confronts us as a state and a nation is really our commitment to our values. Will we be a nation that's inclusive? Will we be a nation of shared prosperity? Will we be a nation that is true to the promise of democracy? That's really what confronts us. That's, that is what every single day you come here and you prepare yourself to become leaders of the world. That is the central question that you must ask yourself, that is the central question that confronts you in all aspects of your life. And so I applaud you for, for being here. Fight on, as you guys would say. Um, and, 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 and thank you for, for this opportunity. There are a few people that, that don't need introduction but, but deserve it. Uh, Ralph Furtig, uh, dear friend of mine for many years. He's been a great supporter of mine. I think I'm the only elected official he's walked precincts for. I hope I haven't disappointed him. Um, and his son is a dear friend of mine as well. We went to, to law school together. Um, Angelica Salas has just been a day in and day out champion for the rights of immigrants uh, in this city, in this state, in this nation. And thank you. And of course, and I'm not going to get a grade for this, you know, I don't get any extra credit, but I will tell you that Manuel Pastor is a dear, dear friend of mine. I think it may be the first time we've shared a, a panel together. Uh, we've been friends for t over 20 years. And I'm so excited because, like you, we were once young. And we had this whole, you have this whole excitement that's at this point in your life, right? You're going to change the world. You're going to do the things that you, you're in class and you talk about it and you say, why are, they think, why are things like this? They, they should change. And, and so you're in this moment of discovery. And so you, you see the world and you, you're beginning to make friends and, and, uh, and networks that you'll take with you beyond school. And you think, okay, well, you know, I would do this differently. And then you're going to go out and, and, and see how difficult it is. But... And Manuel and I were once like that. And we met, he had just come from Boston. Uh, I was here, I worked uh, desk to desk, desk mates with his, with his wife. And, and you know, we were at that same moment and we sit here today and, and I'm so proud of his work. Uh, I will talk about values and immigration and why I do what I do, but, but when I need to have data, and data is critical, when I need to be able to talk about the truth, and the facts that, that, that under, underlie are the moral choices that we choose. I always look to, to Manuel. I always look to Dal Myers. I always think about the great work that's done here because the fact of the matter is we're right and they're wrong. That's just the fact of the matter, right? The math is, 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 is what it is. It's the bottom line. The, the demographics are the destiny of this nation. And the fact of the matter is, is that the, the choices that we propose, a choice of inclusion of immigrants, of embracing the immigration values and the immigration agenda, the choice of choosing America today and for the future, is a choice that can be broken down into math, into demographics, into economics. It's really simple. There's no reason why we should have this incredible and extraordinary anti-immigrant hysteria that takes place. Now, I have been in the legislature for, this is my 15th year. I served eight years in the Senate. The Senate has an, uh, a committee that deals with international relations. And during my, my tenure, I, I had an ability to travel the world. And I will tell you, it's amazing. Every time I go 
around the world. I'm gone a few weeks. You know, you try to catch the news. You're in your room. You're in meetings. You're constantly, you know, adjusting to different culture, language, food. Uh, you're not watching the television. You try to get a glimpse of what the, the headlines are. But you're kind of out of tune with what goes on in this country for two weeks. Then I fly back. Usually you fly into Atlanta, Dallas. And then the reality of America hits you again. And then you put on the television and you put on CNN and MSNBC and then sometimes accidentally Fox. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then you find out that we're at war and that we've been invaded. And you're like, what is going on here? We're, when did we declare war? Did I miss where I gone that long? And then there's this fabricated, phony, made up war against immigrants that is irrational. And Dr. Pastor can give you the data and the facts that tell you it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense not to have an immigration policy that embraces and integrates immigrants into our economy because guess what? We're getting old. Right? People are getting old and they're aging out of the workforce. And we don't have enough workers. That's math. That's a real simple thing. Guess what? The baby boomers, those little spoiled brats, didn't have enough babies. Right? Because, you know, it's, it's all about them. It's about the me generation, right? So they're like, I don't want to have babies. I've got to take care of them. So they didn't have enough babies. And as they get older and they're aging out of the economy, we don't have a replacement workforce. I mean, we need like a million educated workers. I mean, you guys are going to have great opportunities if we make the right choices, great opportunities in the future because there's such a great demand in our economy for an educated workforce. Right? Guess what? You know that driving a vehicle is an inherently dangerous activity. Inherently dangerous. Right? Weighs a ton or two. You know, you have to have a degree of maturity. You have to have motor skills. There's rules about consuming alcohol or drugs. There's rules about talking on your cell phone or texting. Stop it. I promise I will. Uh, the co-author shouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> and yet, we don't let two and a half million motorists take a test to make sure they're competent to drive. How irrational is that? That's physics. A vehicle that's driven by somebody who doesn't know the rules, that person will stop unexpectedly, will turn inappropriately, will do something that makes it dangerous for everybody else. That's physics. Right? And then finally, the DREAM Act. We're Americans. The whole point of democracy is to move away from the, 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 the systems that were in place, the monarchies, the caste systems, the systems that, that said you're, where you're born is where you stay and there's no prospects for change or progress for you, your family, or the society. And so people came here yearning to be free. And the great thing about our nation is that that one education can transform your life, the life of your family, your community, and you can become a major participant in the society. That's the main point. And so what, what ensures that that takes place? What value, what statement ensures that that is our reality? The fact that we do not blame children for the acts of their parents. Remember that? Remember the McCarthy era? Joe McCarthy was like going after this, this family and these kids and are you reading the people's world? Your parents had a subscription to the people's world. And someone said, Senator, have you no shame? Because in this country, we do not blame children for the acts of their parents. And that's the foundation of the California Dream Act. There are young men and women brought through no choice of their own. Now, my family came in 1921. Saragossa, Durango, right? Poor family. Came to El Paso, worked in Yuma in the mines, worked in the Coachella Valley, worked in the fields, and then ended up in Barstow. 
Now, how hard was it where they came from that Barca was the place that they ended up? <laughs> I was like, man, did you have a house? Did you have like, I mean, what did Barstow? That, that's it, you know? And uh, and they came to work uh, in the railroad company, right? Excuse me. So they come to work, and my father comes to Los Angeles. Angeles, grew up here in downtown L.A., and, you know, it's very, very challenging, but in one generation, one scholarship, the life of my, my life, my family, my community is transformed, right? Because we rely on that. We rely on the vitality of the immigrants to come in and be critical to our economy, innovative, ideas, right? And we don't hold that back by blaming children for the acts of their parents. And so that's what the California Dream Act does. It says we're not going to blame children for the acts of their parents because children don't have a choice. The whole point of my story about Barstow is that as a kid, my parents would say, get in the car. That's what you do when you're a kid. Do what your parents say. They say, get in the car. When your father is a boxer, you get in the car fast. You know? <laughs> they say, get in the car. You get in the car fast. You know? No videos, no, you know, things to play with. No, like sit down in the back, don't talk. Three, three hours, three and a half hours to Barstow, you know, 54 Chevy, you know, 50 miles an hour. That's brutal. That's child abuse, you know? <laughs> they should be studied in social work here, you know? And, uh, and so think about that with immigrant children. We have a video that I don't, I hope you get to see. We're working on a documentary. We have a program for it. But, you know, I, there's a guy, uh, David Cho, who's in our video. Came from Korea. You know, get in the car, go to the airport, get in the plane, get off, and you're like, okay. Right? Grows up, studies hard, getting ready. He's going to go to school, and then goes to ask his mom for the social security number. And she says, we got to talk. And then he finds out, it's not a citizen. He's been admitted to UCLA, one of the finest ins public institutions. <laughs> public institutions. <laughs> Did I tell you UCLA was one of the finest public institutions in this nation? He gets admitted to UCLA. But because his parents brought him, he came, played by the rules, learned another language, got the top grades, you know, 55,000 applications, 8,000 admits, 4,000 come in. He gets in. He can't get a scholarship. Now, don't get excited here. He's the band leader. Now, uh, you know, there's like two major positions in this city that you want to have. And it's not mayor and it's not county supervisor. You want to be the band leader of USC or UCLA, right? <laughs> if you're in music. I mean, there is no other place you want to be. There's nothing more American than being the band leader of USC or UCLA. And David is the band leader at UCLA and he's undocumented. He wants to join the Air Force. He wants to become a senator. What a contribution this young man has to make for our nation. But yet we're hysterical over this, this anti-immigrant disposition that is dominated by shrill voices. Not by thoughtful voices. Not by voices that can articulate irrefutable facts, right? But by lies and deception, distortions of our reality, but worse than that, of our values as Americans. That is really the affront that the anti-immigrant movement has with respect to, to, to our nation and to our values. Always a nation of inclusiveness, always a nation of, of values, always thoughtful about how we go forward based on facts and then based on 
our values. Uh, I want to thank you uh, for this morning. I, I have a great speech. Uh, we'll publish it. Hopefully it sounds something like what I said. Um, but I just want to thank you for the morning. I heard the young man up here singing Paul Robeson, and, and, and I just want to thank you. That is part of our tradition. Um, my poor son, he grew up. I used to play Paul Robeson for him as a kid. I was about, you know, a generation behind schedule. And, uh, you know, he, he, he sometimes sings Old Man River to his, his granddaughters. And don't, for, don't make them suffer like I made you suffer. Uh, but it, it really is part uh, uh, those songs, uh, that music, um, however we got here. And whenever we came, uh, we should never forget that we're all Americans and we have one destiny. We have shared values. And, and those are to make sure that every person, and this is probably, I'm, I know I'm speaking to the choir and underlies what every person in the School of Social Work, this incredible school that produces 40% of the social workers of our state, is that every human being should be treated with dignity and respect as God willed it to be. Thank you so much. God bless you. Have a great morning. Okay, let's have one more round of applause for the assemblyman. We should always honor those who work tirelessly for the vulnerable of our society. Thank you, Assemblyman. Thank you indeed. Now I'd like to introduce our second keynote speaker, who is Professor Manuel Pasteur. And he's here at USC, not UCLA. Um, <laughs> but we're so happy that he's here with us. He is the founding member, of the, di the director of the Center for Justice and Tolerance and, and Community at the University of um, Santa Cruz, California. He currently directs the program for environmental and regional equality here at USC. And to add to his many of his duties, he co-directs the Center for the Study of Immigrant Integration with Professor, with Professor Archmarie Hancock, who we'll be hearing from today, um, later this morning. Professor Pasteur holds a PhD in economics from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and has received numerous awards and fellowship both from universities and national foundations. Um, Dr. Pasteur speaks frequently on the issues of immigration and social justice. It is indeed then my great privilege to have him to speak to us today. So please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and I also uh, want to thank Gil Cedillo for those very kind words. I did want to note that, indeed, we have known each other for more than 20 years. Um, I have many more gray hairs than Gil, though, so uh, still trying to figure that out. Um, so uh, Sherry asked me uh, in 15 minutes, she said, could you please speak about immigration and social justice and provide a broad historical review of uh, shifting sentiments and national moods around immigration, an overview of the contemporary debate, including an even-handed description of different positions, including those that are clearly wrong, uh, a sense of what all this means for the future of social work practice, including professional paths for all of you, and a pitch for donations when you become alums, and if that wasn't enough, she asked whether or not I would do a sort of immigrant analysis of the Grammys. Uh, 
including speculations about which British singers were performing without sufficient documentation. <laughs> Was it Sir Paul McCartney or Adele? Because we know that the song Rolling in the Deep really means rolling in the deep undercover. Or perhaps it was Lady Gaga, who may be New York-born, but is clearly an alien. <laughs> Now that's a lot to do in a 15-minute keynote, or as we say in Spanish, quinotito. So instead, what I'd like to do is take a few minutes to talk a little bit about what's the reality, why is the debate about immigration so heated, and what needs to change in order to provide a more civil tone uh, and a more future-oriented and forward-looking perspective in this debate. So in terms of the realities, the first thing to understand is exactly the demographic change that uh, uh, Senator Cedillo was uh, pointing to. Uh, You know, uh, by the year 2042, uh, we will be a majority-minority nation, or as I like to think of it, all minority all the time. Uh, <laughs> by the year 2019, 2020, those under the age of 18 will be majority people of color. It's probably this year that the majority of births are to people of color. Um, between 2000 and 2010, the last census, The Latino population grew by 43 percent. The Asian Pacific Islander population grew by 43 percent. The African American population grew by 11 percent nationally. The uh, non-Hispanic white population grew by only 1 percent. So that's that change. Now, when people hear those numbers, what they tend to think that's driving the numbers for Latinos and Asian Pacific Islanders is immigration, right? But that's not it at all. For the last couple of years, immigration has been on the decline, and it's not simply a result of the slow economy or increased enforcement at the border. There's really two long-term trends. One is that the fertility rate in Mexico has gone down from over five children per woman to 2.1, which is very close to the U.S. rate of 1.7. So that push factor is disappearing. And second, we don't like to think about this, the economies of Latin America, while they're not all that great, are actually doing better than we are in terms of generating growth. There's great stories about Brazilians, for example, deciding that they have to leave Boston where they can't get a job and go to Sao Paulo where they can, right? So there's a shift to the developing world, the fertility rate's going down, and while in the popular imagination, many people are worried about the browning of America, Gil is right, Most demographers are worried about the grain of America and the fact that we will not have enough immigration in the future. And you can see this happening. Uh, most of our growth rate is actually being driven by those being born in the United States who are the children of immigrants. Between 2000 and 2010, the number of non-Hispanic white children fell by 4.7 million. Now, that's not that 4.7 million young white people died. we would have noticed that. <laughs> you can, that cohort shifts because some people become 19 and 20, right? And less people are coming in at the one and two. Uh, African-American children fell by 250,000. Latino children up by 4.8 million. Uh, and Asian Pacific Islanders up 800,000. So that's the future that we're talking about. Those are the facts that are uh, irrefutable. And the other thing that's very important for social workers is the geographic diversity of this immigrant population. People are increasingly going directly into suburbs. They're going into new places like the south of the United States, and they're going into more African-American communities. All of those places do not have the infrastructure in place to deal effectively with uh, new immigrant communities, and that's going to be the frontier of social services and social work. Another important reality has to do with the economic role of immigrants. Most economists, virtually all economists, if you're very liberal to being very conservative, agree on one thing which the public doesn't. Immigrants are a net boon to the U.S. economy. They add labor, they add spending, they add productivity, they add innovation. 
There are debates about not the complementary effect of immigrants, but the competitive effect of immigrants, and whether or not immigrants who arrive in the United States wind up having uh, competitive effects on particular people in U.S. labor markets. And here's what's interesting. The group demographically that benefits the most from immigrants in the United States are non-Hispanic whites, tend to be more skilled, immigrant labor tends to be complementary, tends to lower some of their costs. The group that's hurt the most by immigrant labor in the United States are immigrants who are already here, particularly Latinos. And the group that sometimes is hurt, sometimes gained is African Americans. Interestingly, when you go to the polls, you know who's the most worried about immigrants? Not Hispanic whites. You know who's the most open? Latinos. You know who's in the middle? African Americans. Suggesting that African Americans are the only rational political actors in the United States. <laughs> and this, by the way, was the primary reason I voted for Barack Obama. I mean, I just... <laughs> so given what these facts are, why is the debate so heated? Uh, why can't we... Again, the other thing, of course, and you've got this in some of your uh, data, is that immigrants tend to contribute more in taxes than they wind up receiving in services, particularly when you control for income. And the people who contribute the most are undocumented immigrants because they don't wind up taking uh, from uh, Social Security. They pay in. They don't get it at the end. Uh, there are fiscal strains at a local level because immigrants with families tend to tax educational systems and local hospital systems. That has a lot to do with some of the debate. But why is the debate so heated? Um, well, it's interesting. I mean, when you think about the debate, some people are saying, well, there's too much immigration. But the facts are there's probably not enough for what we need. Some people are saying there's very interesting things to hold at the same time. Immigrants are taking our jobs, and they're all on welfare. <laughs> Hard to put together in one sentence. Some people do. <laughs> the other thing that's going on is immigrants are all these Mexicans. Interesting fact for you. Of the... For immigrants who arrived in the last 10 years in Los Angeles County, for immigrants who arrived in the last 10 years, recent immigrants, what percent of recent immigrants into Los Angeles County do you think are Mexican? Well, what does the public think? 100%, 150%, right? <laughs> Super Mexicans arrive across the border. <laughs> I count for more than one. Um, it's about a third. About a third of recent immigrants are Mexican. The rest are coming from other Latin American countries, uh, Korea, uh, Vietnam, the Philippines, South Asians. It's a very diverse population. So a lot of uh, myths that are out there were often operating in a sort of fact-free zone. Why is the debate so heated? Why don't facts count? I would suggest to you that there's four reasons. One is that on the debate around immigration, there's some pretty deep conflicting values. Uh, uh, Senator Cedillo talked about values, but we have values of immigrate, being an immigrant nation, but we also have values about being a nation of laws. And so some people have deeply felt feelings about a nation of laws. The facts about contributions don't break through those deeply held values. That's the position. It's tough because it's a complex issue, and you can't simply... Uh, deal with one community, you have to deal with all of this diversity, you have to deal with where we're headed in the future, you have to deal with the complexity of the economy. It's tough because people tend to look at the snapshot versus the trajectory. So people look at where immigrants are right now, and essentially what they do is they look at that guy in front of Home Depot, and they imagine that's the guy that was there 20 years ago, and 20 years from now it's going to be the same guy, right? What they don't see is the change over time that people, when they spend more time in country, their incomes go up, their skills go up, they do learn English, right? But what happens is, particularly in new locations with new communities, it's what our colleague Dal Meyer calls the Peter Pan effect, where people think immigrants who just arrived will never age. Uh, they will always be young. Gil and I hope we can find that secret, actually. Um, and then finally, we have to acknowledge that a lot of this is about race. Um, Another interesting statistic emerged from the census, which has to do with the issue of age disparity by race. The median age for non-Hispanic whites is uh, 42 years. 
half older, half younger. The median age for Latinos is 25 years, 27 years. I'm sorry, it's a 15-year difference. And there's a lot of anxiety about the changing demographics. So how do we change this? I think we change this not just through policies but through narratives. We have to focus in not on immigration reform but on immigrant integration, how to bring people in and make progress over time. We have to focus in on a rubric of social justice and why our current laws and policies do not reflect the best of us. And we have to rethink the broader American story. I was struck by this title, Do I Look Illegal? Because what it reminded me of was the following thing. My father arrived in this country in the 1930s with papers that were imperfect. When World War II came, he was given a choice between being deported or joining the U.S. Army. And he couldn't figure out what to do, so he gave a penny to my cousin Carlitos, who flipped it. And the penny came up a particular way, and my dad and the penny went to the war, and they both came back safe. And a generation later, his son is a full professor at the University of Southern California. which would be an even greater achievement if that translated into season football tickets, but nonetheless. <laughs> and, you know, that's a great story. That's an American story. And in some important and fundamental way, it's the wrong story. It's the wrong story because when it's told that way, what it sounds like is a single family and their ganas, their desires to succeed. And I don't discount that. You have to have ganas, you have to have energy, you have to really get out there and work. But my dad had a path to legalization that was provided by the opportunity to serve in the U.S. military. And my dad in the 1930s had no papers, but he had a union that protected him. And when he came out of World War II, there was a GI Bill. And that GI Bill meant two things. One is that he could go to L.A. Trade Tech, two miles away from here, and learn about electricity. And with that, go from being a janitor to being an air conditioner repairman, and my family could go from being poor to being working class. And he had a GI Bill, which meant that he could buy a house in an inner ring suburb of La Puente, where we grew up, and get a stake in the American dream. And we went to public schools that were decent because people were investing in them. And I went as an undergraduate to the University of California, Santa Cruz, because there was affirmative action to take a chance on a kid like me that did not fit the usual profile at that time of who was supposed to be in college. And that I would submit to you as the American story. Not just individuals, but the social policies that make it possible for people to achieve their dreams, and more importantly, the social movements, the labor movement, the civil rights movement, the veterans movement that made all those policies possible. This is a moral challenge, this is a policy challenge, and this is a movement challenge. And as you do and go forward to do your social work, you need to understand that the relationship to social movements and organizing that makes it possible for social work to be viable, that's the secret sauce of the American dream, not just individuals, but how we work together to change policies, to change the narrative, and to change hearts and minds. Thank you. Okay, what great speeches. We've learned quite a lot this morning and we're certainly going to use it as social workers. And we have our two keynote speakers here that we can actually ask questions to, which is a wonderful thing as well. So can I ask Assemblyman and also Manuel to actually join us here on the stage? Thank you. They thought that we're coming to have a good time, but we're going, to <laughs> we're going to make sure that we ask them all sorts of questions, things that have been bothering us about immigration for some time. I know, it's like walking the line, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so here we are. The, the mics are around, and um, I can also see the people in the balcony, so... 
feel free to oh, yeah. ask a question and to stand in line. All right, so who's got the first question? Yeah, come on down. <laughs> Don't be shy. We never usually are shy, I'm sure. Okay, can you say your name and then say who you'd like to ask the question to? Uh, my name is David Curry from the San Diego Academic Center. And I'd actually I'd like to address uh, the assembly member, but also make reference to uh, uh, Dr. Pastor's uh, personal narrative about having a father that had enlisted in the Army and how those different types of social narratives uh, in terms of timing and resources ultimately, you know, uh, created the foundation for uh, uh, a lot of progress for his generation within his family. I know that one of the uh, main components of the DREAM Act was not only in terms of uh, accessing higher education for uh, children of undocumented citizens, but also military service. What is your opinion on expanding the parameters of public service Considering the fact that so few people uh, in our country commit to public service, and I mean everything from whether it's being a social worker doing like the grunt work like child protective services, to being a teacher educating our children, to uh, you know whether it's military service or providing service, whether it's firefighters, police departments, what is your opinions on expanding the public service parameters as a pathway to citizenship in terms of uh, having that? type of commitment to service that a lot of our own individuals, particularly uh, Caucasians, uh, do not commit themselves to in terms of a pathway to citizenship uh, to where no one can argue that type of commitment to being a citizen because of the fact that so few people are willing to give back and provide public goods to our society. I think it's an excellent idea. I, I really do. I think, uh, I think it makes sense. I think a lot of people would favor that, uh, that, adding that to the menu. Uh, and you could visualize, uh, because my observations of, of uh, dream students is that they're not locked into one area. They're just students who happen to have this, this uh, circumstance. But they're architects, they're engineers, they're future d doctors, they're future scientists, demographers. There's a whole range of which uh, those, talent those talents and resources could be integrated into our economy. And I think it's a brilliant idea to integrate them in, particularly into the public sector, uh, because they bring an energy and a um, sense of innovation, and creativ uh, create, cre creativity, uh, into the, the academic environment, and they take that right into the workplace. And I think it would uh, make public service and the public sector probably even stronger and more vibrant. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Pastor, I want to say thank you for your father's service as a Marine Corps veteran of uh, Iraq and uh, Afghanistan era. It means a lot. Thank you. Uh, my dad was airborne. Sure. Oh, great. Um, can we have one person from the balcony? Um, could you say what your name is and what questions you have? Oh, there's no one there. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. So should we have somebody from the left-hand side? Okay. My name is Sharonda, and my question is directed at both um, Professor Pastor and um, Assemblyman Gil Sadio. It's a, a basic question with regards to relationship amongst and coalition building with African Americans and the immigrant population, Latino population. You mentioned in your um, speech that um, a large um, influx of immigrants into the South, which has historically been an African American community with a large population. Um, and how do you see the two communities coming together, working together, as opposed to what is seen in other parts of Southern California where there's a division amongst the groups? So do you have any suggestions in terms of how the two groups could work together to build a, a strong alliance with regards to this issue? You know, I think we're probably both going to want to comment on this because uh, uh, the Assemblyman and I have been uh, working on black-brown coalitions. It's probably been a defining characteristic of both of our kind of organizing lives. Uh, you know, the, when you look at the news, what the news tends to take a look at in terms of African-Americans and Latinos is the 
stuff in immigrants generally is the stuff that's going on about which there's conflict. They never look at the daily accommodations, right? They don't look at the ways in which people live together in South Los Angeles. They don't look at the ways in which there may be fights in schools, but kids are also in schools doing things together. They don't look at groups like Community Coalition in South L.A. that have built tremendous unity between black and brown youngsters. They don't look at uh, the way in which the labor movement uh, in Southern California has built great ties between African-American workers and Latino immigrant workers. They don't look at the NAACP in Mississippi, which has taken a leading role in defending the rights of immigrants. They don't take a look at the ties between the freedom riders of an earlier generation and the dream activists of today. The media, as usual, is missing an important story. Now, I don't want to sort of sugarcoat the fact that there are some, indeed, conflicts, uh, you know, tensions, uh, et cetera, but there's a lot more good practices going out there than actually the media ever lets you hear about. And we did a, uh, we, we have a website, CSII, the, our center, the Center for Study of Immigrant Integration. We chose that in part because CSII sounds like a television show. Um, <laughs> so if you go to csii.usc.edu, what you'll find is a pretty uh, intriguing uh, paper uh, on the issue of uh, African-Americans and immigrants, and it's called All Together Now, uh, African-Americans, Immigrants, and the Future of the Golden State. I want to say one more word about this. Um, I think that for those of us who've worked mostly on the immigrant rights side of this, one of the things that we really need to do or avoid is the following thing. I think on the immigrant kind of rights, immigration reform community, too often what's going on is people say, gosh, how do we talk to African-Americans to get them to support immigration reform? That is a very utilitarian notion of how you build unity between groups. What's more important is to say what's central to the African-American community, economic advancement. Well, that's something immigrants are really into as well. What's central to the African-American community? Uh, protection from racial profiling, right? Uh, well, there's a lot of ties there. What's central to the African-American community? Educational opportunity. What we need to do, and that's what our report's about, is build an agenda around everyday social justice. And that everyday social injustice will include immigration reform, but that'll just be one part of it, and that will build a deep unity rather than shallow coalitions. was efficient, I would just say diddle, uh, <laughs> because I couldn't agree uh, more. I, let me, first of all, I got to do this uh, shout out to my dad. You know, he was, uh, he's a veteran, he was 82nd Airborne, so I want to make sure that uh, you understand this experience. But I, I, I raise that because uh, my dad was in the South, and he served in the South, and so I grew up, as I said, in Boro Heights, because this is really the way, what I believe. I grew up in Boro Heights, and, you know, obviously I've spent my life, professional adult life, uh, advocating for immigrants, but I grew up in Boro Heights listening to jazz music. Because my dad grew up in, uh, his youth was in the South, 82nd Airborne. He grew up here in Los Angeles, went to all the dance clubs on Central Avenue. He was a great dancer. He was a boxer. I mean, and so... That's the kind of, you know, Billy Eckstein and, and all the great jazz musicians and the big bands. It's the music that I grew up listening to. The Mexican music came on really late when we were already asleep. And, uh, and, and so tomorrow I'm going to go listen to Ronnie Laws and he invited me to come over. Uh, I was the general manager of Local 660 and, and I'll tell you how this accommodation, as Manuel says, takes place. Every day, Latinos and African Americans are doing something together. In the county of Los Angeles, they work together every single day. And so a lot of this, this focus, this attention on, on uh, challenges that confront these two communities is really a distortion. It's, it's a myth. I call it a myth in many instances. It's, it's what professionals focus on, uh, journalists and, and maybe advocate groups. But the, the reality is, is every single day in this great city, people are getting along all the time, working together side by side. My dad worked at American Can Company. He worked there with other uh, Latinos and African Americans and, 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 and white working class people from the Southeast Corridor. And, and at our house, it was a very diverse group of friends that my dad had that came over. 
and then they'd take us to go watch the Rams, and they'd, you know, have their drinks and, you know, do what, what working men, men do in factory life. And so when I worked at, uh, with uh, my mom's wife at SCIU Local 660, it's an African-American union, primarily. And the kind of workforce is significantly African-American, but people are getting along all the time. And, and so sometimes it upsets me because I hear all these stories like, oh, you know, like, you know, the people aren't getting along. And it's like, well, maybe there's, there are those moments, there are those tensions. I don't want to, you know, diminish that. But, but you know, in music, in culture, in sports, in, in daily work, in romance, I mean, look at all these Afro-Latino children that are born at General Hospital. You know, I mean, somebody's getting along for some period of time, you know. And, and those relationships, because I got cousins up in Lancaster, those relationships change dramatically with the childbirth and the marriages. And now your, your grandson and granddaughter is, you know, the African Americans are learning Spanish and, you know, Latinos are getting a little more, you know, cooler and hipper and, you know. So, so, uh, but as, as Manuel says, we, we need to, to look at that in terms of what are the core values, right? People's desire to take care of their children, how industrious they are, how much they have these hopes and aspirations, and how those hopes and aspirations are shared. I've been on the, uh, uh, on the board of the National Rainbow Coalition. I've been a member since 1984, but on the board since uh, post-88, and, and there's a lot of extraordinary stories that go on every day in this nation of African Americans and Latinos working together, Asians, everybody. I mean, this is an extraordinary country. And, and I'll tell you, my test is, and I think you did a lot of work with the Marshall Fellows, is when we bring people here from other countries. And so a lot of times these uh, Marshall Fellows will come, and the young leaders, young political leaders will come and they ask me, particularly at the front of my political career, to meet with these other young political leaders. And so we'd bring them and take them around Los Angeles. And they actually thought that we were fabricating the, you know, like the attendance at a Korean restaurant in the middle of the week. You know, like, did you invite those people to come here? It's like, no, everybody, you know, lives in Los Angeles and we get along and we, you know, share space and share food and culture and music and, and that's what we do. And so, uh, so much... Uh, the last thing, so much of this is driven uh, by politics, uh, a bad economy, and then people who are purveyors of hate. And, and, and if there's anything that, that, uh, that I think that would help this is a more critical eye on those who are purveyors of hate uh, in this country. Uh, being on the radio, being on the television is not an absolute right. And I think we need to be more thoughtful about how liberal we are with those who go on with complete lies and complete distortions about what's taking place in this country. And the result of that then is a, is a promotion of, of hate, which then leads, which then leads, according to studies by this liberal organization, the FBI, leads to uh, more violence based upon people's uh, ethnic background. Okay, so we'll have our next question. Hi, we're also streaming the event to all of our virtual academic center students, and I have a few of their questions. One, just for now, is what do they think it will take to pass the Federal DREAM Act? And this is coming from Tammy Wilson in Sugarland, Texas. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, I actually, I mean, just by way of a somewhat serious answer to it, because um, I mean, the, the challenge right now is that it's been politically p paid off within the Republican Party uh, to be scapegoating immigrants. And that's perceived as a, uh, something that, to which there's some political gain. Um, and as a result, in primaries, it's, I mean, it's, it was really striking to see, you know, Rick Perry, uh, well-known liberal governor of Texas, uh, attacked for kind of living in Texas, basically, right, and understanding that there's lots of undocumented people in Texas, and they, they go to the universities, and he just said, gosh, you know, seems kind of inhumane to not do that, and he just got mauled, right, by the other candidates. So I think there's something going on 
within that uh, political party, frankly, that's going to be very, very uh, tough to change, although you also see elements within that party trying to say, we might want to have a Latino vote for us sometime in the future, right? Uh, and so there's some really interesting issues in terms of where the votes are at with that. I actually think what will move it the most uh, is if we could bring business on board in this debate. One of the things that I'm kind of really happy about is we run a Council for Immigrant Integration for Los Angeles, uh, uh, which is really run, I mean, it's paid for by the California Community Foundation, and it's predicated on the following thing. One-third of the residents in Los Angeles County are immigrants. Half of our workforce is foreign-born. Two-thirds of our children have at least one immigrant parent. Ninety percent of those kids are U.S.-born. They're not going anywhere. And how they and their parents do will determine the future of the region. And that's actually brought business on board. And so one thing that was very interesting, and I think I can talk about it later, is that we brought together a group of very diverse people, and the two people who wound up bonding the most out of the council were David Rattray from the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce and Angelica Salas from the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights. And David is a deep supporter of the DREAM Act and has been able to deliver some chamber support. I think in order to move this along, what it's really going to take is business understanding that the long-term future of the economy depends on how productive these workers are, that why would we invest all this money, uh, K through 12, in these young people who get the right to go to school, and then at the moment when they can actually go to college and really be productive and begin to pay back, why, or in the military, why would we abandon them, right? And so I think that that rational economic argument does have some salience with business, and I think that that business voice can help move more conservative Democrats and more conservative Republicans into understanding that this is really something that's in the nation's self-interest. Thank you. Ah, next question, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ruth Han, and my question is, um, my understanding of California DREAM Act is that it provides financial aid for the undocumented student. However, when these students graduate from college, they can work with their undocumented status. Um, how will these students be able to get a job after graduation with their bachelor's degree? That goes back to an earlier point that the uh, professor had mentioned that a lot of times people visualize these as, as uh, static, right? That, that somebody's circumstance, that this situation, that that same person in front of Home Depot is going to be there it was there 10 years ago, it was going to be there in 10 years, and it's the same situation. And the fact of the matter, I actually uh, said this when the bill was signed. I, I learned this from my mother. I mean, here's a woman who worked in a sewing factory, didn't graduate from high school, didn't have those opportunities. Your immigration status, or education is for life. The degrees you get, your training and preparation are for life. The other thing we know about these students is that their legal status is temporary. It's going to change. I cannot give you the exact date for the exact person, but for every single DREAM student, their legal status is going to change. It's going to change as a product of policy. The DREAM Act gets passed and signed. Immigration reform happens. It's going to change because an administrative law judge reviews a case and says, you know what? Uh, my intern, Mario Escobar, now a professor at uh, Arizona State University, you get granted your, your political asylum because you cannot go back to El Salvador because you were forced to be a combatant. It's going to change because somebody gets married and, and it changes their legal status. People fall in love, they get married, they have American children, and then their stock and their capacity to become legalized uh, changes. So their status as an educated graduate is permanent and for life, but their status as an immigrant is going to change. Their legal status will change. And finally, there are some people who are very creative. While it may be illegal to work for somebody in this country, it's not to own a car, own a business, own a home, to form a business, and then as a business you sell your product, to be an engineer, an architect, and sell your renderings, to be uh, a, a a law school graduate and sell your research, to be uh, a person who, who is not just taking graduates and making them nannies, but making them uh, people who use their intellectual product 
and then sell that on the market. And for that, they'll become integrated in the economy. It's, it's, it's complex. It, it's, it's more challenging. It, and, it, it, and it's the reason why we need immigration reform, because why go through all that when we have an educated workforce fully ready to be integrated into our economy? Thank you, Assemblyman. Um, time is getting really short on us, and I have to say that unless your questions have to remain short at this time, and the answers have to remain short at this time, um, I hate to say this because, you know, it's such a, a meaningful topic to us, but um, I'm just looking at my, my timeline, and we're well over it already, so I'm just um, saying no more people to the, to the, to the stand. Um, the person that is, and I think there is a person now, we're representing the, I'm representing the upper tier. Oh, wonderful. My name is, uh, <laughs> my name is Valerie Richards and I'm adjunct faculty. And I was wondering if you could speak to what uh, progressive minded people can do to change the way in which the dialogue around immigration is framed. Uh, so I'll, in, in two seconds. Yeah, I, I, I realize that asking a professor and a politician to give short answers is uh, quite a challenge. I want to thank you for your question from the upper tier. I know it's not from 1%, though. Um, and so what I would say, the primary thing, is to talk to someone uh, who doesn't agree with you. Uh, so being in an echo chamber where you go, yeah, gosh, that Arizona law is stupid, uh, etc. I think it's much more important to try to reach out, particularly through faith-based communities, etc., to people who are in the middle, people who might be to have some legitimate concerns about immigration and speak to them, develop one-on-one -on -one relationships, and change things in that kind of a way. You know, being shrill, I mean, it works on MSNBC, but, uh, but it really doesn't work at moving the middle and changing the debate. Oh, but thank you. Thank you. Um, next question. Thank both of you so much for coming in today and sharing your family histories. And that's really an important part of what the American dream used to be and what's kind of fallen by the wayside. My family's history is very much in, in keeping with yours. But it's kind of pointing to the underlying issue that's really missed. You, you pointed on it, Councilman, thank you, of immigration reform. It's how, how do you anticipate going about making the ability to become a legal American accessible again so that these people who are coming here and having such a tremendous impact on our country can do so and not bear the stigma of an illegal status? Well, I, I think that's the challenge that, that will we'll confront the next president. Uh, I think there was a failing, a lapse. I, you know, I don't apologize. I supported the president. I campaigned in three states. I was one of the first uh, Latino elected officials to do that. Uh, and, and so uh, we were all disappointed that the administration, with majorities in both houses, uh, didn't take very prompt affirmative action to, to try to uh, achieve uh, some degree of immigration reform uh, in the first 90 days, in the first 100 days, in the first year. And I think that they reflect now that it was a major failing uh, of the administration. Nonetheless, I think it is the only uh, administration or the, and the, the president is the only one who has that firm commitment uh, to do so. And, but it will be a greater challenge and unless there are more people uh, who are elected who recognize this point of view, who address these facts, it's, it's going to be an incredible challenge for the administration in the next, the next term. I agree, though, uh, incredibly with, um, tremendously with the professor. This dialogue needs to be moved to the middle. And so if you're progressive, you really have to move to the middle. It's, 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 uh, we will win and we are right and they are wrong, but we cannot be by ourselves. And this discussion has to be in the middle. I think the example that, that uh, the professor mentioned about Angelica Salas, this very important civic leader with David Rattray from the chamber and their friendship, is very, very vital uh, for us. Uh, the role that the chamber played in the California Dream Act was critical. Uh, the news coverage, the editorial board support, 
And now what was very important is that we got editorial board support for the DREAM Act from almost every newspaper in the state, including conservative ones, but because it was focused on uh, the importance to immigrants in the future of our economy. Bottom line, nothing else, and the core American values of not blaming children for the acts of, of their parents. We had support from, you know, the New York Times and from, I mean, there was a period of a week, we got the New York Times and we got uh, all the prominent Christian Science Monitor, uh, all the prominent national newspapers, right, USA Today, we were on everything in one week because we had come to that moment where the facts prevailed and we got away from the shrill discussions and we were able to have a very sober and deliberate conversation in the middle where the American people like to, to, to sit. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Vermi? Uh. Hi, my name is Vimi and I'm an immigrant myself. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you for the knowledge and discussion you have provided. Thank you so much. I would like to know, uh, since the new immigration law were uh, passed in several states, has there been a decrease in the asylum and refugee status um, in giving or seeking both ways? Uh, in terms of seeking asylum and refugee status, I haven't noticed anything yet in those numbers. I will say that one of the things that's happening with these laws being passed in different states is that the action around immigration has moved down to this local level. Uh, in part, that's because of the federal inaction uh, that uh, Gil was talking about, that instead then what happens is that all these localities are passing laws. I think it's very important for us to point to these negative examples of Arizona and Alabama. Many of you may know that the first arrest for lacking papers in Alabama was of an executive of the Mercedes-Benz company, um, that it just made a major investment, and now they're they're kind of rethinking whether or not they'd like to be in Alabama, uh, the land of show me your papers, right? Uh, but we also have to pick up on some positive examples. So, for example, the Utah Compact, which has brought together business people, civic leaders, faith leaders, immigrant rights leaders, to have a more civil conversation around uh, immigration in that state. I don't like everything that they're doing, but just the fact that they've agreed to have a conversation in the middle, I think, is really important. So as many bad things are happening at a local level, there are some good things happening. We need to lift those up as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Juan Carlos Casino, and he's a social worker and VAC student in an immigrant shelter in Arizona. Uh, he wants to know, what are your observations in regards to SB 1070, and how, could, how would you de define reasonable suspicion of SB 1070? Uh, with respect to Arizona, I think one of the, the, the problems, and we, uh, we agree on this, is it was the chamber, arguably, in Arizona that put a stop to this whole introduction of all these regressive legislation. It was the boycott, and I'm, I guess I was the author of the boycott for the state legislature. It was the boycott that had the impact on the chamber that, that they said, look, you got to stop introducing these things because it's having a, a big impact on us. It's hurting our economy. It's hurting our ability to do business, and so we have to step back from it. There, look, those, those, those pieces of legislation, as I said the first day and second day don't pass constitutional muster. Uh, they simply don't work. Uh, they're going in another direction and they're going backwards, not forward. History moves forward. And so, uh, you know, the time will come where we'll look back as we do on many other things in this nation, particularly during hard economic times where we say, wow, that's really embarrassing. How did we go for that? So, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And our last question. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, please. Yes, thank you. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Soto. I'm a VAC student with the November cohort. And I was just wondering, um, when the DREAM Act came about and they started talking about it, I personally found it very hard to get a clear picture of what it meant and what it was and what impact it would have because everything that I heard was about how, how, can, we, how can we afford to pay for immigrants when students are currently taking on loans um, that are exorbitant and that are more than they can pay now. And I just kind of want to know, what's your response on that? Because, I mean, I, I have feelings for both. Obviously, I'm Hispanic American. My family has a lot of immigrant status itself. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, in, I'm ambivalent either way. And I just kind of want to know, what is your response to those people who think that um, because you're an immigrant, you don't deserve an ed education, or if we can't afford to pay for our own American citizens, um, you know, does that make sense? No, I understand. So let's do the facts, okay? 
We talked about the values, but let's talk about the, the legal history. First of all, this great state is the state of Mendes versus Westminster School District that said we can't have separate schools. Bam. Okay? Con- constitutional. The law. Let's talk about the law. Next, that led, and that was the precursor to Brown versus Board of Education. Right? Separate but equal is not equal. Inherently unequal. Offends us constitutionally. On the specific question of the legal status of students, the Plyler case, Plyler v. Doe in Texas, it said, look, as a society, we don't want to segregate these students because of their legal status. We don't want to deny them education because it creates a subclass. This is is the language of of the court. Creates a subclass, and we have poor subclasses. And these people will be destined to be, be poor, illiterate, and a burden on our state. So the logic, the reason of our courts was these students are students for all purposes. Now, that was challenged on Prop 187 in California, and the court said, look, it doesn't work. We did AB 540. I'm the co-author with Marco Fireball and others. Challenged in the U.S. Supreme Court this year, and the court said, look, AB 540 is the state's response to having immigrant students in their state, but it's not an, an, an immigrant exclusive program. It's a program for all California students. It says, if you grew up here and your father's in the army and they say, you got to move to Texas with me because I got <coughs> stationed over there, and you want to come back to California, you're not going to be called an out-of-state student. You're going to be considered an in-state student if you meet the three years. The three years requirement of high school is across the board, whether you have legal status or not. And so then, for all constitutional purposes, students who are AB 540 in California are equal to all other students. So if the students are equal, they pay the same fees, the fees fund the scholarships, then why shouldn't they be eligible for the same scholarship opportunities? There's no ration, rational reason for it at all. And if you think about the needs of our economy and why we educate people, I asked the, during the, my seven years battling the Schwarzenegger administration, I said, well, why do we educate these children? Why well, we want them to become productive. I said, then we'll take that logic one next step once they get admitted to the University of California. And so from that point, when you follow both the, the law and the demographics and the economics, there's no reason why we shouldn't. In fact, we must and should fund them because, because we need those workers because they're not going to be in the workforce. We need those bridge builders, architects, yeah. engineers, scientists. Where's the next Steve Jobs going to come from, et cetera, et cetera. So just a one-minute thing, which I think is important. During the debate on health care uh, and the passage of the Affordable uh, Care Act, uh, you may recall that a congressman screamed at uh, President Obama, you lie. And it was about the issue of whether or not the undocumented would be able to buy into private health exchanges, right? So what happened was everybody agreed, no, they can't, right? Now think about that for just a minute. If you have undocumented <laughs> workers and you're saying, I'm going to prohibit them from buying private health insurance, right? Number one, they're probably younger and healthier. That's exactly who you want to be buying health insurance, right? Number two, if they don't buy health insurance, then they're going to county, and we're paying for them through our taxes, right? But because we made the issue so politicized, so hysterical, so racialized, right? Everyone agreed. The undocumented can't buy into the health exchanges, right? My response to your thing is really around the same thing. How can we afford not to invest in these kids? How can we afford to allow their productivity not to be developed and captured in this state? We need to go beyond the heat uh, to get a little light in this debate. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I thought they were going to... Is the last question over here? The last one? Um, Mr. Uh, it's for Mr. Sadia. Excuse me. Hello. Where are you? Were you, right were you standing before? Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Make it quick then because it's we're running quick. out of time. It's very, very quick. And it, um, very short. Very short. Mr. Sadia, I'm also a proud Boyle Heights um, product. And Go I'm writers. also an adult school teacher. And although the attention has been on post-high school graduation, um, there's a 100% cut to adult ed in LAUSD right now. We serve, well, there are 22 schools, we serve 325,000 students, um, some that are trying to get credits to get high school, uh, their high school diplomas, English um, learners as well. What can you do and what can you help us do to um, ensure that we have 
educa adult education and safe adult education for our, our communities. So there's a whole conversation, a whole morning that the pre professor and I would be willing to come back to talk about California's economy, and the li ninth largest economy and how we make that work. <laughs> We we're at $2 trillion of economic activity. When I got elected, we were at $1.4 trillion of economic activity. We once had the best education in the country, number one in funding. The University of California, the CSUs, interrelated, uh, integrated with our, our private schools, K through 12, the best in the nation and perhaps the best in the world. We're not there, though. Even though we were at $1.4 trillion of economic activity, now we're at $2 trillion. So we have $600 billion more of economic activity, and yet our funding went from a high of $120 billion for state services. We're at 85. People have been told that they could have more for less. And so we give tax breaks to companies and to corporations. We tell people, don't pay your vehicle license fee, your car tax. Don't pay your car tax, and you can still have more for less, and it just doesn't work. And so people, I'll tell you the first thing people can do, everybody in here, can think about supporting the governor's efforts to stabilize funding for the state of California. That is a very real and concrete proposal. Now people say, oh my God, Gil Cedillo came and said he wanted to raise taxes. When we've gone from 1.4 trillion to 2 trillion, we need to raise revenue, it should be fair, equitable, those who can't pay should pay, and people have to be responsible. You have to be an adult. You cannot have quality education. You cannot have an infrastructure that's good for business. You cannot have social services that are important that, uh, that define our humanity without paying for it. And so you just have to be responsible and you have to pay for it. Specifically to the, the adult schools, we had a press conference in my office on Tuesday. We were there Tuesday night. We were there yesterday. We will oppose those cuts because in the city of Los Angeles, in the city of Los Angeles, you have to educate everybody because if you have an immigrant family comes and the kids go to school and then they want to come and talk to their parents, the parents have to be able to be responsive. We undermine the education of, of K through 12 if we don't educate uh, their parents. And so that is so, so vital in the city where, you know, over 100 languages are spoken, just teaching people English. You know, a lot of people say, oh, they need to learn English. It's like, well, let's teach them. Let's have the classes. We're for that. Manuel and I are for that. And so we support that. The other thing is, is we gave flexibility to the schools with these cuts. But the flexibility wasn't, and the intention was not to cut down adult education. And so we will work with that. But if you want these things to happen, right, this discussion is going to take place. We have to have one proposal because if you ever have more than one, they do not pass, that to raise revenue for the state of California so that we can restore the funding back to education, and that proposal is a proposal of the governor. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, our speakers have been wonderful, and it's just been a really, really great morning. And our morning hasn't finished yet, so, but we're going to have, um, by the look of it, a five-minute break, which isn't much of a five minutes, and people can't complain because we've gone over time and we allow people to actually ask their questions. So five minutes and everybody back into um, the hall, please, so that we can continue our program. Thank you.
barrio la cachimba se ha formado la corredera. En el barrio la cachimba se ha formado la corredera. Allá fueron los bomberos con sus campanas, sus sirenas. Allí fueron los bomberos con sus campanas, sus sirenas. Ay, mamá, ¿qué pasó? Ay, mamá, ¿qué pasó?
Okay, everyone. Okay. Can, can you find your seats, please? Thank you. Find your seats, please. everyone. Can everyone sit down? Thank you. Sit down. Thank you. Okay, everyone. All right. We're about to start. All right, Neil. Okay, it's always a, a really good sign when um, people are so infused and can't stop talking about the topic. So in order to continue the morning, we have some outstanding panelists as well. And I'll take the opportunity to introduce them to you. The first person I wish to introduce is um, Dr. Neil Frenzen. Professor Frenzen specializes in immigration law and is the director of the USC Law and Immigration Clinic, which partners with the School of Social Work. Over the years, many of our students have volunteered in this clinic. And in the couple of years I've been here, I've also supervised these students. So it's a very worthwhile and interesting um, clinic to actually be part of. Dr. Frenzen has been teaching at USC since 2000 and practiced law since 1985. He has represented hundreds of asylum seekers and other immigrants and has litigated numerous federal court cases challenging the mistreatment of non-citizens. He also has litigated immigration courts, national security cases involving all sorts of evidences. He has participated in human rights delegations on behalf of Amnesty International USA, the International Association of Democratic Lawyers, and other human rights organizations. So we would like to welcome um, Professor Frenzen. A round of applause for Professor Frenzen. Then the next person that I'd like to introduce is Angelica Salas. Ms. Salas is the executive director of the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights of Los Angeles, CHILA um, is the, um, the acronym, and it is widely regarded as one of, and she is widely regarded, sorry, as one of the most gifted activist organizer in the country today. Ms. Salas began her work with CHILA in 1995 since becoming Sheila's director in 1999. She has spearheaded several ambitious campaigns. Um, she's helped to win in states tuition for undocumented immigrant students and established job centers for day laborers that have served as a model for the rest of the nation. She's led efforts to allow all California drivers to obtain a driver's license and is a statewide and national spokesperson on immigration issue. Thank you for coming today. And last not least is Dr. and Professor Ange Marie Hancock. Dr. Hancock joined the Department of Political Science in 2008 
After five years as an assistant professor of political science and African-American studies at Yale University, she has served as an international expert in American politics for the USA Department of State and during the 2008 presidential election. She has been quoted in the New York Times, St. Petersburg Times, and the San Francisco Independent, and also supports college newspapers and national public radio station by serving as an expert. Professor Honcock is the author of the award-winning book, The Politics of Disgust and the Public Identity of the Welfare Queen, and she is a globally recognized scholar uh, of the study of intersectionality. Please give her a warm hand. And what we'd like our panels to do is to um, speak for five minutes on the work they're currently doing in immigration and social justice, and then we'll open up the floor again for people to be able to um, participate by asking questions. Thank you. So if we start off with um, Professor Frenzen. So uh, thank you, Dean Short. Thank you for uh, inviting all of us to be here today. One of the problems with not being the first speaker is uh, other people have addressed some of the things I think we were all planning on talking about. So I've been going through Xing out a lot of, uh, a lot of my comments and, uh, and, and keeping, I'll try to keep an eye on the timekeeper as well. Um, let me also just you know, give a quick uh, thank you to, to Vimi Jaggi and, and Sarah Tynes uh, and, and to Dean Short and, and Professor Fertig. Um, uh, Vimi and Sarah are volunteering in my clinical program at the law school um, during the current academic year. We're recruiting some new MSW students to come uh, work in the clinic for, for the, next, uh, uh, the next year, and, and it was really uh, uh, Professor Fertig who introduced me to Dean Short some years ago that got this program uh, up and running, so, so I appreciate it. So in, in, in regard to... Um, uh, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit about the Obama administration. Um, I voted for President Obama. I'll probably vote for him again, um, but I am incredibly disappointed. I began my practice in, in Florida under the Reagan administration uh, back in the early 1980s, and I thought immigration practices were bad at that time, and now I look back you know, longingly at the Reagan administration days and, and President Reagan and, and the immigration policies. Um, uh, the Obama administration has done some, you know, it's done some good things, but it's also done some really, really bad things. And, and I just want to talk about three particular areas. Um, the Obama administration is deporting people at a faster rate um, than has happened perhaps in U.S. history. Uh, the Obama administration administration is deporting people at a faster rate than the Bush administration uh, has uh, uh, during the eight years of the Bush administration. Um, the Obama administration is increasing the use of immigration detention facilities. Um, in the past three years, uh, Homeland Security has added three new detention centers in Los Angeles, two down in Orange County, rented space from the Orange County Sheriff's Department, and a new for-profit prison up in Adelanto, um, probably close to where uh, Assembly and Cedillo grew up uh, um, not quite to Barstow, but, but almost to Barstow up, up the I-15, run by the GEO Group. Uh, again, if you're looking for ways to invest money and make money, the for-profit prison industry is a growing industry in this country and in the world. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I say that as a joke, obviously, but it's true and it's profitable. Um, and we have for-profit corporations that are advocating for greater uh, detention, uh, use of detention in, in the immigration context. And unfortunately, uh, the Obama administration, or at least the Department of Homeland Security, has, has uh, gone down that, you know, gone down that path. We also have tremendously increased local law enforcement. I'm not talking about Arizona laws, the Alabama laws. I'm talking about things like Secure Communities Program, uh, the so-called 287G cooperative agreements. Lots of people who come into contact with local law enforcement are run through, um, are checked by Immigration and Customs Enforcement and come on to the uh, Homeland Security radar for purposes of commencement of removal proceedings, not because they've committed a crime, but because they've had some interaction with, with law enforcement. Not saying that if you're a crime victim, you should be fearful of going into a, an L.A. police, uh, talking to a police officer in Los Angeles or walking into a police station, but that is the reality in the community. People are fearful uh, of the police because of the 
the secure uh, community programs and uh, um, and, and the so-called 287, uh, 287G agreements. Um, the undocumented population is a major population in the United States. It's not a good thing. It's in no one's interest to have an undocumented Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. It is, some people are perfectly content uh, with having an undocumented population, having a shadow population, because people profit from that. Um, uh, having a more vulnerable workforce is something that, that, that obviously some employers um, uh, uh, benefit from. One of the, uh, conse- one of the reasons we have um, uh, an, an undocumented population uh, is people used to come and go uh, irregularly, illegally, if you will, um, because it was easier to do that. Um, one of the uh, problems, one of the you know unintended consequences of increased border enforcement, of increased militarization of the U.S.-Mexican border, um, uh, has been uh, people when they get here. It's more dangerous. It's more expensive. Uh, they stay here. Fifteen years ago, I, I remember representing a group of uh, uh, undocumented Mexican uh, strawberry uh, pickers. They used to come back and forth to the United States uh, according to the seasons. And now if you get here, you do not want to leave here uh, as a result. And so, again, one of the, you know, one of the unintended uh, uh, consequences of, uh, uh, of, of harsher immigration laws. Um, one other, you know, one other, uh, you know, improvement, I should say, uh, so, you know, one of the few improvements that we've seen recently with the Obama administration uh, is a, a, a new proposed rule that might permit some of the undocumented who are present in the United States to legalize their, their status in the United States. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with this concept of unlawful presence. Um, prior to 1996, if you were uh, illegally present in the United States and if you developed a way to legalize your status because you were married to someone who had a green card or married to someone who had a U.S. citizen, uh, you would just leave the country get your green card, and come back to the United States. Since 1996, we have this concept, uh, statutory provision in the immigration law that penalizes people who have been unlawfully present. And so in a nutshell, if you have been present in the United States in an irregular, illegal capacity for more than a year, even if you have a way of legalizing your status, you have to live outside of the United States for a decade for 10 years before you can return to the United States because you're married to a U.S. citizen or because you're, you have a U.S. citizen child who has petitioned to immigrate you. Um, there's a waiver for this unlawful presence, but you have to apply for it outside of the United States. No one knows how many of the 10, 11 million undocumented people in the United States have an easy path to legalization because they're married to a citizen or married to a permanent resident, it's definitely hundreds of thousands. It's, it's probably uh, uh, more than a million individuals who have an easy path to legalization, but they can't risk pursuing that path because they would have to leave the United States, apply for a discretionary waiver, and find out while they're outside of the United States whether or not they're not going to get, the, whether or not they're going to benefit from that waiver. Uh, the Obama administration, just within the past month or so, has proposed a rule um, uh, to allow people to apply for these unlawful presence waivers before they leave the United States. We'll see how it gets implemented. Um, is this pandering to, uh, uh, to the uh, Latino population for, for purposes of the presidential election? Perhaps. I'll, I'll take it. Uh, I'm happy to, you know, be at the receiving end of, of, of some pandering. Unfortunately, there's plenty of pandering uh, that's going on in terms of the restrictionist community and the anti-immigrant community. Uh, I wanted to say a few words specifically about the Arizona Arizona law um, questions have come up, but if people want to talk about that, we can do that during the, the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name Angel- is Angelica Salas with Chirla, and it's, real, it's a real honor to sit on this panel with both of you, Anne-Marie and Niels, but especially with Niels, who is actually was my boss. This is how I got my job, because this man was the chair of the board of Chirla for many, many years, and he's my mentor, and he's the person who really, uh, one of the people who really have, has inspired me um, to fight and to do this kind of work. I accomplished work. one good thing as, as board chair. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really, I, it's just a person who I deeply respect, so it's just an honor to be here. Um, 
So what do we do at CHIRLA? At CHIRLA, we, uh, we basically say we educate, we organize, we advocate. We educate the immigrant community so that they know their rights, because they do have constitutional rights. They do have, um, fall under civil rights. They have rights. They have labor rights. But many times they are made to feel and they are made um, and they are excluded from those rights. So for those rights that they do have, that they fight for them, that they know their responsibilities, um, that they understand what the resources are in this community, so that they can actually thrive. We talk about, we organize. There are so many individuals who live in isolation because what we have done with our immigration policies is created an underground society, a society that is set apart from the rest of our communities that basically feels as part of their need to protect themselves, to, to basically obscure their presence in, in this city and in this country. And so many times people are going through many situations on their own and think that they are the only ones going through it. And then all of a sudden, when we actually bring them together, whether it's day laborers who are looking for work in the corners and who are not getting paid, um, even though they've worked an entire, you know, days and days, but whose wages are cheated, whose wages are robbed. Um, or maybe it's a household worker um, who is made to work, um, you know, way past the, uh, the eight hours, who isn't paid even close to minimum wage, or the street vendors who are, who are constantly being harassed because what they're trying to do is survive, or immigrant youth who really are fighting to make sure that they have an opportunity in this country. So in isolation, you feel you're the only one. But when you organize and you connect, you're like, wait a second, it's happening to you and it's happening to you too? There's something wrong here. And together, we're going to fight. So for us, this is a core element of what, a, a core um, strategy of our work. And then um, we advocate, but we don't advocate for immigrants. We advocate with immigrants because there's nobody else who can tell many of these elected um, officials what reality is than the immigrants who are going through it or their um, friends and neighbors who love them deeply and who don't want them um, to continue living in this underground society and not protected like everybody else. And so what we, um, what we do at CHIRLA is ensure that immigrants have a voice, um, that they fight for what, it, what they deserve. And I want to also, I was asked to talk about what is the state of um, immigration, what's the state of immigrants right now? So I thought I'd share with you um, three quick stories of individuals that just recently had come to Chirla. The first one is Teresa. Teresa called us crying, frantic, because ICE had come to her house and had taken away her husband. They came to the house. She, she has temporary protected status, which is a legal status in this country. All her kids are U.S. citizens, and her husband's undocumented. ICE came to their house and took away a man who, ba who um, was so ill that he still had, and, and was undergoing dialysis because of his severe diabetes, with still a catheter um, stuck to, to his body. This man, without any kind of... Of, of, of humanity was taken and deported in, to Mexico without um, any any sense, any um, understanding that if he it, his life depended on having his treatment, and that in Mexico he could die. And so Teresa called us and she said, I am willing to do whatever it takes for, you, for my husband to come back. This is not right. It is not fair. What do I have to do? So what did we do with Teresa? We said, we are calling our congressman. We are call we're getting you legal assistance. And we are talking to every single member of the administration around what just has just happened. And that's exactly what this woman did. She talked to her congressman. She said, this is not right. This man in from Pasadena um, needs to be here with his, with his children. And it, it was a huge saga, but because she fought back, her husband spent Christmas with them. It's one of the one of the cases where we're actually able to bring people back. I'll, I'll tell you the case of Isaura. Isaura Garcia was, it came to our office because she was in the process of deportation. When we and she came with um, with her boyfriend. <laughs> very shy. We weren't sure exactly what was going on. And she said, I don't want to be deported. I have this little boy um, that I need to take care of. 
as we began to talk to her more and as we were able to talk to her alone, we discovered that the reason she was in detention was because she had called 911. And she had called 911 because that boyfriend who had come with her was beating her up. And she wanted to be able to get her child out of the house. The boyfriend, who spoke perfect English, talked to the police department and said, you know what, she's the one who's beating me up. And in cases of domestic violence, many of you are, are studying this, many times they take both, both parties or whichever the party is that they thought was the aggressor. They take Isaura in. Well, Isaura... Um, is undocumented, and because of this program of secure communities, the way it works is once you put your fingerprints into the database, then ICE, um, and all this is done through technology, the FBI databases, ICE says, ding, ding, there's these fingerprints that show that this person does not have status in this country. We want to place a hold on her. So who got punished in that situation? Who was in line to, to be deported? It was Isaura. Isaura comes to us and she said, I am tired. I am tired of being beaten up by this man, and I am tired of, of, of this situation. So what did she do? She um, stood up. She talked to a very shy woman, had, took all the courage in order to speak to the press and say, secure communities is wrong, because she stood up. We have changed part of the policy around secure communities as it deals with domestic violence victims. But secure communities still exist. It needs to get, we need to get rid of it. And the last thing, as I see wrap up and we'll get into the message. So what is the solution for Isaura and for Teresa? The solution is immigration reform. But really at the core of getting immigration reform is an American movement of, and made up of people who understand that this country is better than what our immigration laws are making it out to be. That this country, need, that people in this country need to be organized and connected in order to push our elected officials to have courage. And, and not just to pander during election time, but actually do their job when they're in office. And so I invite you, and I'll give you more information on how you can get involved, but it takes us. If we get involved, we are going to make um, our elected officials do what is right, and we're going to join a bunch of courageous immigrants who are already standing up for their own rights. Thank you. Uh, so I am the, probably the newest person to Los Angeles on this panel, um, and so uh, I first want to say thank you uh, for the invitation, um, and it's really wonderful to address All School Day. Um, I also want to say to the folks online, uh, hello, um, as well as buenos dias, uh, ni hao, and uh, bonjour, because uh, I'm well aware that we all um, come from many different lands and uh, speak many different languages. Uh, I, and I, I can't go to what I want to say without saying that. In the year that I've known Angelica, uh, one of the things that I love best about her, she always talks about the wins. Um, and I think for those of us who are studying social work, who are doing this work on a daily basis, we see so many losses. It's nice to hear that we also have wins on our side as well. And in this topic, we see so many losses. It's so nice to hear that at least, even though we don't have enough wins, we have some wins that sustain us and keep us going. And so I think that's really important, and I'm so glad that you're on this panel with us. Um, in terms of uh, what I would like to do, I actually have, because I'm a professor, a class participation thing. For those of you who are under 30, and I'm looking at you, and I know many of you are under 30 in this audience, um, don't worry, it's easy and there's no grace. Uh, I just want to ask you, if you're 30 and under in this audience, and you guys in the balcony and you guys online too, raise your hands if you have close friendships not just, you know, you ate dinner at their house one time or you traded notes in class, but if you have close friendships, stayed as an overnight guest, that kind of thing, with people who are first or second generation immigrants, but come from a different ethnic or racial background than you. So if you're 30 and under and you have those friendships, raise your hands. So we, so we have a good number in here, and I'm sure there's a good number online as well. Now I want to ask everybody in the audience, though, to think about your grandparents, and think about the relationships and the close friendships that they have and ask yourself if those grandparents of yours have those same close stay at each other's homes, have helped raise each other's children, not just with immigrants, but with immigrants from a different background, right? 
And so what, if you think about that, how many of you think your grandparents have those same close relationships that you all have? Not nearly as many. And so the reason I had you guys just walk through that briefly is to really get a sense of the cross-generational, cross-ethnic, and cross-national status issues that we're dealing with right now in 2012. We have different generations that have vastly different levels of experience with folks from different immigrant groups, folks from different racial and ethnic groups, and folks with different national statuses in this country. And so one of the pieces of work that we do at CSII is really to walk through the idea of how do we deal with what we call the cultural generation gap. The fact that older folks and younger folks don't just look demographically different, as Professor Pastor told you, but also have vastly different levels of experience that really make it hard to come into the public square and then decide what's best. And so I want to talk about three things that are connected to our work at CSII that are really important for our conversation today, particularly as it regards what the kind of work that I do, which is the work regarding receiving communities. So Professor Pastor talked about, and there was a question about the changing African-American communities, whether they're here in South Los Angeles or they're in the South, and how they're transforming in terms of immigration. And how do we prepare those communities, not just in terms of infrastructure, which we absolutely need, but how do we prepare the hearts and minds of the people themselves to actually deal with the facts that their communities are changing? And how do they actually interpret that, particularly when we know that there's a social context and a media context that wants to socialize them into fear, that wants to socialize them into hatred? So how do we prepare those receiving communities to actually be welcoming communities? And so I want to look first at the kind of issues that are concerned with um, something that some of your professors do, aging in place and immigration. And first what we work on is the interdependence between those younger generations. And I just want to highlight one quick thing about the investment in K-12 through education that really does start to have resonance with some of the older populations that both Congressman Cedillo as well as uh, Professor Pastor talked about. And that was really the idea that, of course, the folks who are getting those K-12 through educations right now that we don't think we should pay taxes for or we don't think that we should actually have to invest in are actually the folks who are going to be providing the health care to you, the home health care workers, who will be age as you want to age in place. So there's an interdependence there in terms of older folks understanding that these investments are not just investments for other people's kids, but these are investments that will help the entire society. The second thing I wanted to talk about is really having to do with the emotional impact of communities that have been hit hard by the Great Recession. One of the things that we've worked with is really working with communities and lifting up examples that encourage communities to avoid blame of the wrong folks for why things are transforming in certain ways. So why it's hard to get a job after spending so much money on a USC or another college education. Why it's so hard to find a job once you've been laid off for a number of months or years. And I want to kind of lift up two particular examples um, and then return and conclude with my third um, uh, point. Um, so the question of why we need to focus on receiving communities has kind of two prongs. Um, one is, of course, part of being an immigrant, and uh, Assemblyman Cedillo started to talk about this, is the issue of blended families. Okay, when I was growing up all over the United States, I had never dreamed that I would marry somebody whose grandmother had walked across the border into the Arizona Territory before Arizona was even a state. Okay. My sister, two years younger than me, never dreamed that she would move to California, marry a brother from Inglewood who just happens to be Panamanian, whose father could not go to his own son's wedding because it was outside of the country and he wasn't sure he would be able to get back in. And so when we talk about African-American communities' investment in why this matters, it's not just a matter of it's the morally right thing to do, of course it is, but also because this has an impact on African-American communities as well, not just in whether or not we're competing for jobs. This has to do with families. This has to do with love, as Assemblyman Cedillo talked about. 
The second thing I wanted to talk about is regarding the communities themselves, and I wanted to recommend two particular films, one of which we've already screened here at CSII, um, that is, again, not focused on the L.A. context. Uh, we had a film that we showed called Welcome to Shelbyville that's actually about the town of Shelbyville, Tennessee, and how they've been able to really create a welcoming community for immigrants. And again, not just Latino immigrants, but Somalian immigrants, for example, recognizing that there is this racial and ethnic diversity, as Professor Pastor talked about. And so Welcome to Shelbyville is a documentary, but there's also a film right now that's been out, and the actor is actually nominated for an Oscar, because after all, this is still an industry town, right? Um, and it's called A Better Life, and it's actually a fictional story. And if you've seen it, you know that the performance provided by Damian Bechir is just outstanding. And so I re recommend those films to both faith communities and other places as a way to start the conversation about what it means to be a receiving community. It's not the end of the conversation, it's the start of the conversation. And so going back to the third thing that I wanted to kind of talk about, I really wanted to talk about how, in terms of census data, one thing that Professor Pastor um, didn't necessarily mention is the way in which immigration is actually transforming the African-American community itself. So not only are we marrying, you know, folks who are the children of immigrants, um, whether it's Afro-Latino or whether it's other kinds of partnerships, but in addition, immigration is transforming the African-American community. So, for example, in 2010, here in L.A. County, African-Americans, people who check the box on the census uh, as black or African-American, are also claiming sub-Saharan African and West Indian ancestry as well. Up to about almost 15 percent of the L.A. black population does that. So when we think about, again, this idea of immigration is really the right thing to do or supporting immigration reform or being welcoming is the right thing to do, it's not just the right thing to do so that we treat other folks as well. It's, it's the right thing to do for our community as well because even though it's hidden, right, our typical image of immigration is primarily Latino or if we're in certain cities primarily Asian American, right, there is still a significant West and East African as well as West Indian population that is transforming the black community as well. And it's particularly transforming it around ways that have to be uh, very much talked about in the black community. Um, the change in college age population in the black community is increasingly second and third generation immigrant. What does that mean for populations of indigenous born African Americans who would like to go to college? So we really have to have those conversations but have them in a very nuanced way. And hopefully some of the examples that we've provided are able to kind of point folks in the right direction. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, as you can see, we've got a great panel. So come on down. The people who didn't ask the questions before, come on down. Can I see somebody in the balcony? Yes. Please ask your question. Hi, my name is Lauren Johnson. I would like to know, with some people who are creating, you know, a stir with the laws, uh, including some people who are going so far to fight immigration, including saying that they want to abolish the 14th Amendment and change some things that are constitutionally set to help make things fair for people who were born in this country. How is that? How are you guys beginning to make changes in the legislation to kind of counteract even people attempting to do things that are as extreme as this to fight against immigrants moving into this country? Thank you. Okay. So I, I'll answer this. Uh, in, in specifically, let's use the example of, of the fight against the 14th Amendment, which actually is equal protection, and it's one of the most fundamental uh, protections that we all have in, in the Constitution. And we actually had a cong Congressman Elton Gallagly from Ventura, who was the main proponent of this um, change. And... Um, went into Congress in 2010 as the Republicans took over the House of Representatives. That meant that two of the most anti-immigrant legislators, Elton 
uh, Gallagher and Lamar Smith were heading the immigration subcommittee. That's why we can't move on immigration reform because there's no way under the leadership of, of these two we're going to get in. You know, they're going to move anything because we actually need 218 votes from the House of Representatives to move that type of legislation. But what's the what's the situation for, with Elton Gallagher? Number one, um, even within his own party, there was like, you know what? Do you really want uh, Latinos never ever to vote um, for Republicans again? Go ahead move on this um, legislation. This was a real attempt, and, um, and there was a real counteracting internally within the Republican Party um, to stop that. Of course, they went for E-Verify and a whole bunch of other legislation that one by one we've been able to fend off. The latest was the child tax credit, which actually um, provides um, support for U.S. citizen children of tax-paying undocumented immigrants who file their taxes every year. Um, and like everybody who files taxes, you file on April 15th and you get a certain, you get a, a certain amounts of credits. Well, that's, if you're a taxpayer, you're a taxpayer. Well, there was an attempt to go against that. So we fought against it and we're about to win against it. I mean, I, I win, win this, uh, this fight, but it's one fight after another. And so the last thing to say to, about Elton Gag- Gallagher is he's, no, he's going to retire. He's no longer um, going to be a member of Congress because of redistricting and because, you know, there are folks who are getting more and more involved. Out. Elton Gallagher, I'm so happy that he is no longer going to be a member of Congress because he was a member of Congress who would ride on immigration vans and go out and look for people to fi- find them and deport them. That's not the type of leadership we need, and I'm glad that he's been redistricted out. No, thank you. Anyone wishes to comment on that further? Professor Franzen? I mean, I, I would just say, you know, the, the 14th Amendment uh, and, and, and the, 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 you know, one of the, its provisions that you were referencing uh, basically says that persons born in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction of the United States are U.S. citizens. Uh, the 14th Amendment is a post-Civil War uh, amendment. It was intended to clarify that that freed, emancipated slaves would have U.S. citizenship. Uh, and at the, the, this level, uh, it's been an obscene debate, uh, whether it's Representative Gallagher or, or Lamar Smith or others, uh, to basically change the way we confer citizenship um, uh, to people who are born in the United States. It seems to be quiet, at least repeal of the 14th Amendment uh, is quiet at the, time, at the present time, but it's, it's always a, a danger that it will come up again in the future. Oh, thank you. Professor Hancock, anything? No? Okay, great. All right, next question. Thank you. Hi. We have a question from the VAC students. Uh, one is Kamisha Harper from Rose- Roseville, California. She says, I am all for immigration reform. What is your take on the disabled seniors begin as, they, uh, as they begin medical coverage? Sorry. Did I screw that up? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I am all for immigration reform. What is your take on the disabled seniors as they begin to be denied medical coverage? Um, well, I think this is something that clearly has to be fixed um, in terms of what she's talking about is the idea that you can start to be denied medical coverage based on your immigration status, right? And so this is, this is something that, for various reasons, um, it started with welfare reform in 1996 and the contract with America, or on America, as I like to call it, um, and has kind of gone forward in all of these little tiny administrative rules, right? So Congress, in other words, passes a law. It has these generalities in it. And then in the actual implementation, there are ways in which both legal and illegal immigrants, the first part of welfare reform, for example, did not coverage to both legal and undocumented immigrants um, at the same time. Um, and so, and you see some of that playing out in the Republican politics. But her question is about what's the take. And the take is, of course, that's going to transform the ways in which public services are going to be needed um, at perhaps the worst particular time, given the limits of the state, given the limits of localities to actually provide health care services at this time. Um, so... Hopefully, it will get fixed, but again, uh, it will take that kind of the same way that you saw that uh, conflagration emerge with contraception just a couple weeks ago in a totally unrelated note. It will take that kind of kind of pressure from the bottom up to say, no, this is not acceptable uh, for these kinds of things to change. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. 
Anyone else? Well, I think this is where um, sometimes we, we are thinking about federal laws and how to impact them. And in many instances, it's um, our pressure at the local level and at the state level that can actually protect us from the denials of, of, of such care. So right now, um, there's the American Care Act. I mean, there is um, a whole discussion as to how it's going to be um, implemented. It's not just a discussion. I mean, there are ways that it's going to be implemented in the state of California. Um, There are questions, however, about immigrants and how they're going to be covered, whether they're legal permanent residents or undocumented in a family of a U.S. citizen who actually gets health care through their employer or in other ways. So these are, um, so there um, is a whole host of health care providers as well as immigrant rights organizations talking about how to ensure that that nobody is uh, denied um, health insurance or health um, or access to care. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, is any more questions? Yes, let's have a few, please. Okay. This one comes from Elda Mandy. She's in West L.A. She says, who can better address the immigration issues, public, private, or nonprofit organizations? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, I would say all of the above. Truthfully, it's not something that can be as evenly um, kind of parsed out in terms of it should only be a government problem. It can only be a nonprofit problem. It can only be a private solution. Um, as Professor Pastor and Assemblyman Cedillo were saying earlier, um, and Angelica said as well, it takes a movement. And so it takes all of these um, to take different pieces of what is truly a huge, huge kind of concern and to bring the right folks together to the table to actually produce something that's humane, that actually builds out the right infrastructure and then also has a long-term view for what our state and our nation actually end up needing. The only thing that I would add to that is, because I'm completely in agreement, is um, the faith community is, um, is really important in this fight. Um, there is the Interfaith Coalition for Immigra- Immigration Reform, one of the most, I would say, um, inspiring, uh, innovative uh, set of, of folks who, who span, you know, who include the Catholics, the Lutherans, um, Southern Baptists, um, a Muslim, everybody together really saying this is, this is what's necessary uh, in order for our communities and our families to be whole. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next person. Can you introduce yourself and ask your question? That'd yes, uh, my name is Max Molina. And um, my question is, uh, earlier today we were talking a little bit more about uh, the numbers and how the numbers tell the truth. And um, on that regard, there seems to be a smokescreen covering the truth. So my question is, how do we pick and choose how to get through that smokescreen to at least let some of the truth come out? Okay. So the way the way that I see it is um, there's it's so important for us to really um, build community because you know you can turn on Fox and, or any of the other you know um, television radio etc and they can spew a lot of lies but if in your community in your neighborhood you know that your neighbor who is undocumented is a good person. They're, they have, you know, your same values. It's really hard for you to, un, to, to listen to a lot of that stuff. And you actually will see it for what it is, right, which in many instances is um, it's a lot of lies. It's a way by which to get ratings. It's, about, it's a, a lot about a, a lot it's a lot of stuff but the truth. And so I think that it's, that's why it's so important, um, especially I think we always talk to, the, uh, as we organize undocumented um, communities, it's about reach out to your pastor, reach out to your teacher. They do care about you. So this idea that it's, um, you know, sometimes we, we spread this idea that, you know, there's so, so much conflict in this, in this country, and that the reality is it's not. We, but there are the vast majority of Americans really have common sense and they have a a good heart. I mean, they really care about about the future of their country and they care about the future of the families that they live close by. So I think that's what we need to do more and more. And, and And the facts matter, but the facts make sense 
when, when it, in your heart and in your head. You know, it's, it's a combination of both things. So um, that's what I say. And, and it, it is about dialogue and co- having a conversation. There's so many, been so many people who, in many instances, um, you know, I, I give a lot of these speeches, will come up to me and says, you know what, I totally disagree. And I said, okay, let's take a walk. Let's just have a walk together and let's figure what it is. And maybe I'll learn a little bit more about what, you know, I'm not addressing and maybe you'll also understand a little bit more of where I'm coming from. That helps a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Next, next person. Hello, uh, my name is Julio Martinez, and I want to see your opinion about the education of the immigrant children uh, that we're talking about. Uh, historically, immigrant Latino children have had low levels of educational achievement, and um, knowing now that they're the fastest growing population in our country, h- how do you see the future for these children in terms of their education? Are they going to be likely to uh, achieve a higher education now that public education is rising, the cost of it. How, how do you see the future for this children's education, basically? Okay, so um, we actually do organizing of young people in the high schools. So there's 15 chapters, different, of which is 15 different high schools. And we go in and we really um, have a lot of conversation with young people about continuing their education. For a long time, it was like, what's the point of me, you know, finishing high school if I, even if I graduate, I, I, my parents aren't going to be able to afford college and I don't have a social security number, so I, I can't even have access to aid. And so that's where the movement, a lot of the movement came to fight for the California Dream Act. But see, the movement around California Dream Act and um, access to, um, uh, you know, for undocumented students to have access to education, it doesn't just stop with that. These young people are fighting in order for there not to be these horrible education cuts um, at the um, at the university level, at the at the local you know level in terms of the elementaries and the high schools, and also in adult education. So I was really happy when the um, you brought this up on up, up, up there where you brought up uh, the adult education um, cuts. They they really matter, and it it's all it all ties together. So we have to fight in order to ensure that access is real and so um, and that and it takes what what the folks who fought um, you know in terms of the Westminster case um, and Brown versus um, Board of Education that's what it takes it takes people standing up so if you want to stand up for adult education there's going to be another hearing on March 13th and I would say be there speak up and make sure that um, it, that we value education with our, uh, we put our tax dollars where our values are, and we certainly value the education of our community. Uh, I wholeheartedly endorse everything that Angelica just said, and I would just add one uh, quick thing, which is to say, not just on a state and a local level, but also on a national level, this is the kind of issue that is a prime place or location for solidarity. Right. So even if you weren't part of the Occupy movement, one of the themes of the Occupy movement was definitely this idea that there has been this education for what, education for why, right? And so speaking, drawing on one of the themes that Angelica just talked about, there are these other groups that are similarly focused on problems, particularly within the K through 12, but also at the higher education level, that could really push a bold movement to reform how we think about educating folks in this country. And I say educating folks to not just include five-year-olds to 18-year-olds or 18 to 22-year-olds, but adults as well. How do we invest, okay? One of the things that I think is uh, really kind of challenging and that folks don't necessarily have their head around quite yet because they think about their one group, right? There's just the achievement gap for my one group um, or there's just access to loans for my one group is the idea that, you know, there really has been over the past 40 years a disinvestment in education at all levels, Right, meaning that money has not been put forth. Outside of UC Merced, can you name in your lifetime another college or university that has been founded at a public level? And I would bet that the folks online can't necessarily either. And the reason why is because there has not been this public movement for saying we need to reinvest in educational infrastructure, good education for all kids. Not just I'm going to be the education president or I'm going to be the education governor or the education mayor and not do anything, but that we need to really rethink how we invest in education and rethink it for all kinds of reasons having to do with 
bringing business on board, what kinds of workers are going to be needed, what kinds of managers, what kinds of entrepreneurs are going to be needed, as well as all of the things that we might think about in terms of a liberal arts education and basics like literacy and math skills and all of the things that everyone needs across the life cycle. One th important thing that I want to make sure that, um, that we bring to this um, to your uh, response to your question is that uh, Manuel Pastor actually did a um, economic report for us as, um, in our last fight um, this last couple of years uh, as we were fighting for immigration reform and um, and it's basically it's about well what would be the increase in revenue to the state of California if we actually legalized the undocumented the um, over uh, you know 2.5 million people um, who are undocumented in the state of California and what his reports uh, what his report um, unveiled is that there would be a, a net contribution of $16 billion to the state of California because individuals would have legal status, um, they would also have access to better paying jobs, and so there would be a net contribution because part of about how do we have better schools, it's also about us as taxpayers being able to support, to support um, better and, um, and quali quality education. And so I also want to say it's, it's like why are you not allowing people who, want, who are already contributing, who want to contribute more, to do so in order for um, important institutions like education to be, um, to be solidly supported? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Leah Evans. Thanks again for coming. <laughs> I'm curious, based on uh, your professional experiences, in what ways have you seen the LGBT community being impacted by immigration policies, and kind of what do you see as the horizon? I mean, as, as I think Leah knows and, and others knows, um, we used to, until 1990, gays and lesbians were legally barred from coming into the United States. Uh, homosexuality was defined by immigration law as a, uh, uh, as a psychological disorder, and it was only repealed in 1990. It was ignored for many years, um, but it was selectively, usually for political reasons, enforced. Uh, HIV, which obviously affects, you know, uh, uh, all communities, including the LGBT communities, um, uh, was also a so-called ground of inadmissibility that prevented people from immigrating to the United States until relatively recently, the past, you know, it's only, the HIV has only been removed as a ground of inadmissibility, uh, which keeps out communists and polygamists and mass murderers. We also kept out people who were HIV positive. Um, one, again, could seek a waiver for, for, for HIV. The biggest problem for, for having a successful HIV waiver uh, was money. Um, who was paying for your, your medical care. Um, and again, if you had private insurance, that was, that was you know, not, not a problem. So, you know, there have been improvements. Um, one of the focuses in, in terms of how you know, the communities are being treated, one of the primary focuses of, of my clinical program at the law school is representing transgender asylum seekers, mostly Mexican and Central Americans uh, who have grown up uh, in, in Mexico and, and Central America. I guess that goes without saying who have been uh, almost without exception subjected to extreme uh, uh, sexual abuse at the hands of uh, male family members, grandfather, uncle, cousins, um, and also uh, raped usually by police and, and, and soldiers. And so that is a basis for seeking asylum in the United States. Problems, one of the common problems is uh, people who are transgender um, are, are at the margins. Undocumented transgender individuals are at the extreme margins of society in this country. A lot of our clients, again, who we focus on are people who are supporting themselves through prostitution, um, and that just complicates, again, um, their ability to, uh, you know, to, 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 to receive asylum, because in the end, asylum is a discretionary form of relief. Uh, and we, you know, again, talking about ICE detention facilities, we have a special jail in Santa Ana and the Santa Ana Civic Center where, where ICE segregates uh, transgender uh, individuals who are under removal proceedings. Being segregated when you're in jail is a good thing. You know, you know, don't get me wrong. You do not want to be in the general population. I don't want to be in the general population. Um, but it is, uh, there, there are all sorts of problems with strip searches, um, uh, horrific verbal abuse uh, by guards, uh, prison guards who don't understand, uh, you know, what, what, trans, what someone, you know, who is transgender is. is. So. All right. 
No, sorry. I was just going to say the only the other thing I'd like to add is the United Fam, you know, United America's Families Act, which basically um, is um, is to make sure that we include um, LGBT families in immigration reform because in many instances you're not able to petition for your um, your spouse or your children because of your. Um, of your sexual orientation. So there's been some changes. There's been some positive changes under the Obama administration, but not enough. And so we still need immigration reform, and the LGBT community has been amazingly supportive of our fight. Okay, thank you. I know we're coming to the end of our program, so we just have these two speakers, and then that will be it. Oh, as, is it? Right, okay, those two speakers. Sorry, you were trying to speak to. Is it a short question you have? All right. Well, we want to keep it to uh, a very short period. So, okay, you may ask a question, but just keep it short. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. This comes from Taj Artis from Decatur, Illinois, and he says, this question is for Professor Venzen. Why do you think the Obama admin has increased the number of deportations since the president has taken office? What is the rationale for these actions? Uh, I, I, th I think it's political, and, and, you know, we were talking about welfare reform. Um, there were major rewrites, harsh rewrites of the immigration, welfare, criminal laws in 1996. It was Bill Clinton who was president. He was trying to out-Republican the Republicans. Um, this is what President Obama, I think, was doing during his first two terms in office when he thought not moving to the center, as, uh, as Assemblyman Cedillo and, and Professor Pastor were talking about, but moving to the right, um, and that's what Obama did, and it backfired in, in uh, you know, it, it backfired in the midterm elections, and let's hope it doesn't backfire in, in the current presidential elections. Um, I'm a first-generation American, so I'm definitely interested in this issue of immigration. Um, would you, I'm also very interested in the issue of class. Um, can you maybe tie the two, the, the, the intersect uh, ability of the two, um, how this affects, um, you know, the slipping of the middle class, poverty? Uh, yeah. Well, um, it begins when people, I mean, why can't people come in with visas? It's it, because an assessment as to whether you're going to come in, even to be reunited with family, they first look at what your bank account looks like. Do you have property? Um, what, you know, all sorts of things that are all related to your income status. And so there's a lot of people who come with visas from Mexico. Right? They come every single day. They come as tourists. And, you know, why? Because they are the upper echelons of, of Mexican society. So there's visas for the wealthy and not visas for people who are, um, I, and I would say working class, not even just poor, working mm -hmm. class, um, middle income class. They just don't get those visas. And there is a very specific denial based on, on economic class. The only thing I would add is that the other part of it that has to do with class has to do with the cost of legalization. Um, so the, it is very expensive if you would like to naturalize and become a citizen. There are a number of fees so that the folks who are able to pay those fees or able to be smart enough to contact a chair law or someplace that knows about how to subsidize that in some way, shape, or form are the folks who tend to naturalize into citizenship as opposed to folks who are undocumented, who are not aware of their rights, who are not aware of some of the opportunities. They're not not enough opportunities and we need to change the laws, but until the laws get changed, there are a number of resources that if we don't share those with members of the undocumented population, they cannot literally afford to, even if they wanted to, naturalize. Okay. Well, thank you. Hi. Um, I have a question. <laughs> yeah, I know you do. No worries. <laughs> okay, uh, Sean Jones. Uh, I wanted to, on a local level, like since, uh, since tension against the recent community is, uh, uh, it stems from the perception of uh, immigrants, immigrants taking away uh, resources. What can social workers do to change this perception? Uh, good question. Um, I think there, there are a couple of things that really can do. Um, I think one of the reasons why we had this all school day that they came up with this idea was to better prepare social workers for those kinds of changes. And I think there are a number of programs that are already existing where we're working with youth and you're working with other populations where you can introduce these kinds of topics, right? So the idea of films, there's a, there's a wonderful book, it's extremely long, but there's a wonderful book called The Warmth of Other Sons that works specifically in African American communities to really talk about the African-American migration um, in a context that really links 
in very useful ways to the current situation among certain parts of the undocumented population. So there's a story, for example, of um, African-American farm workers who, because they were trying to organize in the orange groves of Florida, were forced to leave as African-Americans because African-Americans were not supposed to organize, were not supposed to ask for fair wages in the early parts of the 20th century, and they were forced out and forced to run away. And so those kinds of parts of African-American history, for example, are things that can be lifted up in particular kinds of conversations about that. Um, the only other thing I would say is that there is a conference coming up um, in April, on April 26th, that's actually going to commemorate all of the different kinds of cross-racial social movement organizing. Um, for those of you who don't know, April is the 20th anniversary of L.A. civil unrest. Um, and so there's actually a number of different organizations that will be coming together to talk about how they've actually been able to forge these partnerships. And it hasn't all been smooth sailing, and it's not always smiley, smiley, let's hold hands together, but that we stayed at the table and we've tried to work together to make a better L.A. Hi, Mike. I'm sorry? Yes. Uh, my question is from Dr. Hancock. Um, <laughs> uh, from intersectionality perf perspective and double oppression, what's your take on immigration-based issues faced by LGBTQ community in Los Angeles or in this country? <laughs> um, I'm sorry. So you're asking me uh, in terms of... Um, an intersectionality perspective. Um, I think the idea from an intersectionality perspective, and for those of you who don't know, intersectionality just simply says that we need to look at categories like race and gender and sexuality together rather than looking at them as separate silos um, because none of us are just our gender. We're not just female on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, for example. Um, and so, so what she's asking me is actually um, how do these two things intersect, particularly in Los Angeles? Um, and I think there's actually been both good news and kind of, you know, ongoing issues. And, and one of the most exciting things, and I think I'm, I'm starting to see this here in L.A. and also other places, um, that the, the other school down the road um, has, uh, has been working with DreamAct students, um, and one of the things that they and other DreamAct students have started doing is really using the language of coming out as undocumented um, that I think has been really effective in starting to help bridge those gaps um, between perhaps LGBT populations that see themselves as not having undocumented or having immigrant populations within them. Um, and I think it's also helped a conversation to begin um, among some of the more diverse immigrant groups, right, that have started to kind of think about how to do this. Um, so there are uh, places like Honor Pack and other uh, organizations um, that have actually tried to start to have this conversation. So I do see some promising things in Los Angeles specifically um, that are attempting to let people be all of who they are every day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Great. I'd like to thank everybody on the panel for their wonderful um, speeches and also for um, letting us understand more about some of the practical issues of immigration and what people see in their everyday lives. You know, sometimes we are quite closeted as social workers and we don't sometimes think outside the box, but there's many people who are struggling um, just to survive. And I think that it's good to sort of have people politically on the ground who are looking out for, uh, for those people in, because they are vulnerable in our society and to have people who care enough to want to change policy, care enough to want to do something practically to help them is tremendous. And they're not social workers, but they are social workers. So, you know, that's why our feeling today should go out to them and thank them again for all their hard work. I know it's a very long time for people to be sitting, so I'm not going to um, take much longer of your time. But I'd like to just um, thank the committee that um, worked so hard to actually help to put the All School Day together. Um, so could you stand? And I'd also like to thank Hillary and her people too. And And... 
And special thanks to my assistant, Susan, because she does all the work in a way. And, uh, Okay, and it's never an easy thing to put um, something together, as you know, and it takes um, lots of effort, so I really would like to thank everyone. Thank all the students for coming, the virtual academic people for actually being here too. It's wonderful to have that connection, and I think it's important that we do continue the old school day in the way it is, because we all group together, we all been able to talk about these really meaningful, important topics to us, and Immigration is one of our key topics. I'll just say, some of the people that I asked to speak, before I asked the people to actually speak, that were here today, um, you know, found the subject a bit um, difficult to actually speak on because it was election year. So we must give an extra thanks to those people who came and felt so motivated to actually talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you all again, and I'm going to turn it over to Lorena and um, to Spencer. One other thing, though, that we do run the immigration clinic, as, as I mentioned, between Professor Frenzen and the School of Social Work, and we're currently looking for people who would like to volunteer. Um, Second-year students is what we're currently looking for, so please contact me or Vermin. Um, she's... Can I, can I see her? Yes, there she is. Um, please feel free to do so because we're looking for more people that want to give their time and want to do something worthwhile. Here it is, the Immigration Clinic. Thank you. Oh. One, one thing that I failed to, to ask you all to do is I'm sure you all have te um, your um, cell phones and you text a lot. So if you want to get more information, you can actually text to 69866, so pull them out, 69866, Justice. And if you text to 69866, Justice, you'll get regular updates and also um, we'll connect you when necessary to your member of Congress when we need you to speak up on behalf of, immigrant, of the immigrant community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much.